And a little bit about me, just quickly. Um, you already know me. I'm a business area manager for Web and Mobile at HiQ. HiQ is a innovation company with realization capabilities as well. Um, we are 1,500 people doing digital innovation of all kinds. Um, I'm leading a team of 80 techno creatives. Someone asked me, what is a techno creative? It's basically a, a nicer word for cross competence or, or to um, work with the fusion of technology and uh, communication or interaction. So this is a new field. If you, if you imagine a hundred or so years ago, transportation was a horse on a wagon and then cars came along and, and they, the engine, the power source is so well integrated into the car you can't really take them apart. This is happening with communication and technology right now. It's becoming one field. And I like to call it techno-creative because I own the dot-com domain, so that's fine. <laughs> um, I'm also an entrepreneur, an occasional upstarter, and I back some companies uh, with small investments and, and uh, advice from time to time, and the rest you know. So, this is my part of my techno-creative world. We're going to look into some of the things here today. Um, what's beyond big data? So big data is something we've been exploring. It's part of why I choose uh, this MBA, actually, because of the big data um, concept. And, but around big data, there's some other things that's happening right now that's really, really interesting, and they converge into something. Um, that I'm not really going to say what, because I think that should be your own imagination, but it will be pretty clear at the end of the, the presentation. There's going to be uh, five mega trends that we're going to look at, and uh, they all have to do with, with people in one uh, way or another. Let's start with ubiquitous computing. Who have heard the term? Everyone? No one? Someone? A few. Okay, so um, I'm going to run a, a movie and, and talk at the same time, if I can. This is from Microsoft, and it shows a future world of 2019, I think, <coughs> for some reason, uh, where ubiquitous computing is a big part of of our world. Computing in the beginning was main mainframe computing, right? So you had one computer and many people working with it. Then came the PC era, the personal computer. You had one computer for every person. And we're just entering the ubiquitous computing era, which is many computers for every person. And it's been defined by um, three different types of computers, which, let's see if I can remember them, it's um, tiles, boards, and panels. Where tiles are really small, boards are more like the iPads we have, and panels can be entire walls that uh, have sensors, that have computing power, that help us in our everyday life. And the thing with the ubiquitous computing is that it's not intrusive. So I think Google Glass is the first um, yeah, thing that's something in between a, a smartphone and a ubiquitous computing device. If you have fitness, fitness bracelets, something like that, some of you have, I think I've seen a few, Jawbone, something else. Uh, those are also ubiquitous computers. You, they don't really disturb you. You don't have to dig your face into a screen to get the value that they're giving you. So a big part of the ubiquitous computing trend is the Internet of Things. The 50 billion devices um, that's going to be uh, connected in 2020. Actually, this projection, 50 billion devices, 
that's been uh, originally done by Ericsson has been revised and Cisco and Ericsson are saying that we are going to reach 50 billion devices online much faster than, than 2020. And if we look at it, it was actually in 2008 that the number of connected devices surpassed the number of people on Earth. This is the, the projection. And you can see where we are right now. It's not that far to 50 billion. So we're probably going to surpass it uh, well be before 2020. It's, it's hard to imagine how, how much is 50 billion devices. And I, I try to um, find another way to um, kind of visualize it in money. Uh, stacks, if you put that on a pallet, it becomes 100 million. And if you take 10 of them, you get a billion. And how many is this? <coughs> it's a trillion. I haven't counted them. And if we look at this picture, the IoT economy, according to Gartner, from today till 2020, is worth 1.9 trillion. So this, I wanted to show this to make it more understandable, the scale of the IoT, and then I realized it became less understandable. This little guy is still there, but it's, uh, this is a tremendous big industry where we can all maybe take one pallet. <laughs> okay. So what, what does this mean? It means that digital is becoming the new electricity, uh, or data is becoming the new electricity. And we've talked about this in the GoTo project, right? And for me, and the IT industry, it means this, that Oliver Gert said uh, from Mediacom, by 2015 the internet will cease to be distinct, it will be woven into the fabric of consumers' lives, like electricity and water from the tap. <coughs> what is he saying? It's becoming boring, right? Electricity is boring, water is boring, data is boring. We have to really focus on the services. What can be done with electricity when well, that's not so boring? Or with water, um, or with data, or connectivity. But this is where we put heading. heading. This is like the, the last thing I want to say about ubiquitous computing, which is really, really interesting. Um, and, and putting things into perspective, the distance between the human and the computer is approaching zero. If we go back to that mainframe computing period, and the first PC that came out in the late 70s, I just estimated that at that point, any personal computer or any computer was probably like, sorry for the kilometers, to be miles. It doesn't matter. It's to illustrate that it was pretty far distance at any point uh, to any person uh, to a computer like maybe 300 kilometers. And if you um, uh, travel a decade in time, maybe that distance had shortened to 30 kilometers. And in the late 90s, the iMac and other commercial uh, consumer PCs shortened the distance even more. Then something happened in the mid-20s. The mobile computer was introduced. And in 2030, I estimate that it's 30 centimeters between the brain and the computer, on average, something like that. And what's happening in 2015? What do you think? Being me, I would say this, maybe? <laughs> it's approaching zero. Which is really interesting. I mean, what's the next step? Implanting the, the, the brain. Yeah, could be. We're getting there. I think. And um, I'm not going to do a demo of Google Glass. Google Glass, because you've tried it, and you can try it um, as much as you want to. I just want to make a point with ubiquitous computing before we leave it. This is how Google wants you to see uh, Google Glass, the concept. Sorry, Nana, if I'm kind of, yeah. But it's uh, sharing your 
dearest moments with friends is very positive. It's very nice. You can do other things with ubiquitous computing when people you meet doesn't understand what, what you're doing, when you have a technology advantage. <coughs> so we got to meet with this man. Let's call him something Swedish, Bengt. So this Bengt, what is Bengt doing? Who is, who is he? I forgot. Did you have a suggestion? Let's say that we apply for a job. <laughs> He's interviewing us. And we have the glasses on, and either he doesn't know what it is, or at this point it's so mainstream, he doesn't care if you have blue glasses on. So let's ask him a question. Any idea? Come on, you all had some alcohol. <laughs> a question? What an interview question. He's interviewing us for a job, and we can ask him a question. Okay. What's the salary? What's the salary? Okay, so that's uh, well, the salary is suspect. The salary is really good. If you, I mean, we have to negotiate it, but it's compared to. And while well, he's giving his answer, glasses are doing something. Compared to the rest of the the job market, our salaries are outstanding. Yeah. So. This application that we, we built for our ubiquitous device is actually, u actually using the same software that border controls use around the world to analyze answers from people who try to get into the country. And it says, um, by 92% accuracy, this man is lying. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, can you see how unethical such a thing could be? Take advantage of computing power in a situation where the other person doesn't understand what you can do with He could be wearing one also. Exactly. And uh, I think, so this is something that's, we, it's, it will be really <coughs> interesting to see what's happening just the coming years right now. So that was the first mega trend. Can you recognize it? Can you see that it's going on? Yeah? So what's going on here? It's a funny picture. That's another mega trend that we're seeing right now. It's called meta materials, and this product is called quantum stealth fabric. If you don't know where to look, look here. So there's a movement in in material research right now. It's called meta materials where you invent materials that doesn't exist in nature in any form. So if you, if you make an analysis of all the material that we've invented uh, as, as a human race, they're all kind of concepts of stone or of wood or of anything that natural. And now new materials are evolving that has nothing to do with natural material. So quantum stealth fabric for example, uses um, tiny, tiny, tiny particles, active particles that divide light around an object so it appears not to be there. Invisibility. And this sounds crazy, but there are over 40 active uh, research projects around the world right now, and some of them are displaying completely invisible uh, in um, techniques, invisibility techniques in the lab. So uh, you can't buy an invisibility cloak yet, <laughs> but it's actually happening, and that's very interesting. There are other meta materials with other um, that have other uh, what you call it characteristics. Yeah, characteristics exactly. But one that I would like to show you as well is. Um, this one, graphene. <coughs> you know all graphene? What is? It's a basic carbon structure. It's a two-dimensional carbon crystal that exists in nature, but only in tiny, tiny, tiny flakes. So not as a solid material. And a couple of scientists took a, um, a pencil, which you call it, a carbon... A, uh, what's it called? A graphite. A graphite pencil. 
and you know, did the, did the dust thing. And then they took scotch tape over the dust, and then they found graphene. And once they had that, they, they could study tiny, tiny, tiny flakes of, of graphene, and they found out that it's the hardest material that we've ever found. It's as uh, elect electrically conductive as copper, at least. It's the most heat conductive material that we've ever found. Uh, and it's as, as flexible as paper. And in its core structure, it's one atom layer thing. So it's a super material, and they've found new ways to um, put these tiny flakes together into uh, much larger pieces. Actually, last week, I think, there was a press release that they found the first way to, to um, produce graphene in industrial scale. So this here is a knot uh, from the fiber, which is 10 meters long, so they can produce knots now. This is a ship uh, produced by IBM, first graphene ship that will be available, commercially available. It doesn't do anything really funny like um, quantum computing or something like that, that you would say, that's really cool. It does the same thing as the... Uh, a ship we had before, the ships, only it's 10,000 times better performing. We'd say that the discovery of graphene would be the stuff for the Nobel Prize, yeah, and actually they got it in 2010. And I would bet money that the next thing I'm going to show will be, could be a Nobel Prize winning thing. Uh, depending on where it goes. It was in, the la in last week's um, Nature. Alien DNA discovered in a lab in California. So, after 4 billion years and 15 years of research, um, researchers managed to create um, a new base pair in DNA from two uh, new nucleotides that are completely unnatural. So you, you all know how, how DNA works in, in general. It's some um, chemicals that stick together and you have four nucleotides and two base pairs and that makes up all of the data in the DNA. And from that you get 20 amino acids that uh, for example, bacteria can use to produce proteins. When they introduce two new base pairs, they have 172 amino acids that can produce proteins. And the, the, the really cool thing is that this DNA in this bacteria reproduced itself. So they introduced it into bacteria, and then it lived on as, a, as alien bacteria never seen on Earth before in a living thing. So, the proteins that will be created from these um, life forms, no one has a clue what's going to come out of it. So this is going to be really, really interesting to, to follow. And it was um, released last week. Did you see it in the news? No. It wasn't in the news, which is very interesting. Because it's really, I mean, just the ethical side of it, of that debate should really be a line in case of that's not. Super disease. Hmm? Sounds like a super disease. Yeah, why not? Could be. So let's move on. I think you're hungry. Yeah. You've seen this one, right? A 3D printed, uh, printed gun. Yeah, someone is in jail in Japan. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, 3D printing went on for a while, and then someone printed a gun, and then it was all over the news. <laughs> Everyone knew about it. But it's a very interesting trend, I think, and it's, it's really, really leaping forward. Um, these are houses, 3D printed houses in China. This company, just I think last month, or yeah, I think it was last month. Um, released 3D printed house commercially from one printer that they built. 
They print 10 houses a day. What's the size of the lens? I don't know exactly. It's, a, it's the small houses like that. But they cost like nothing and they print 10 a day. And, uh, <laughs> I hate that. <I> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But it's like a pen. All kinds of 3D printed things are, are uh, becoming available, like this shoe, hamburger, bread thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I um, think this is pasta for bacon. <laughs> and, and all kinds of candy is coming. It's also do it yourself moment, uh, movement, right? <laughs> So this guy, he really wanted a Austin Martin DB4. I think only 20 were made. Uh, he was in, um, he's in New Zealand. There's definitely not a DB4 in New Zealand. So he downloaded a model from the internet and divided it by, uh, I think it's four by four inch pieces in his computer. And when he's at work, his printer is, is working, putting out tiles. And then he get home and he glues them all together, and eventually he will put the um, he will put it over the missing skyline or something like that. We got it wrong. That's kind of funny. Other projects: the kayak, 3D printed kayak, the skateboard. Lots of things are coming out right now that people created um, in their own little garages or workshops or living room cells at work. So, is anyone sensitive to... Uh, no? No. So, um, following images could be a bit disturbing. Um, this, is, this also just happened. Um, you, you probably heard about 3D printed organs. Have you? No. no? So 3D printers can use human uh, cells to actually print organ structures and that lives in the lab. And then you can try new medicine on these pieces of, of different organs to see how they react, if you can cure stuff or if they're harmful, etc. So a, a couple of weeks ago, um, a research team discovered how to print blood vessels inside these organ um, um, cells or cell structures that they make. So they can actually print body parts. Not maybe a full leg or something like that, but they have printed an ear, including some electronics, and put it on a person. Uh, the first liver to be printed with blood vessels and everything to be put into a person for a, a, a human trials is scheduled for this year. So just imagine what's going to happen in, uh, in medical care with 3D printers. It's really, really interesting. This is also interesting. This is a heart inside a 3D printed uh, hood with an electronic device that's been um, attached to it that when the heart stops beating, this electronic thing starts it again. So it's like a very advanced or the next uh, generation of, um, what do you call it? Pacemaker. Pacemaker. Yeah. That is custom made for its uh, wearer with a 3D printer that prints this hood uh, in, the, in the person's own uh, body cells so it's not rejected by the body. Last one on the theme. This is a skull that's been 3D printed for a woman, a Dutch woman, who had a disease where um, her cranium didn't stop growing. Uh, I think she was 22 or something like that. It's just been done, this surgery. So they removed the entire skull of her and replaced it with a 3D printed um, transparent skull. So you can see her brain. That's nice. Wouldn't you want that? <laughs> I would. <laughs> 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 
I asked my wife if that would be okay. <laughs> she was like, yeah, yeah. You go in transparent and bold. Yeah, of course. No, uh, I guess there's, there would be some hair on here. <laughs> And just when you think that, wow, 3D printing is fantastic. So this is a 4D printed structure. As you can see, it's a bit different. It has different material on these joints. And when you add water to it, it starts to move. And it ends up in a completely different structure than what was printed. So this is just a model of 4D printing with different materials and how it folds up to something else. But you can imagine in the, in the packing industry or lots of uh, applications where this could be, could be used. Okay, next, Megatrend. You've all heard, uh, there's an app for that, right? There's an app for everything. Well, isn't there soon a robot for everything? Here's a very recent example. Um, if you've seen in the news or read in the paper about bees dying all over the globe, there's actual robot projects that seriously are looking at replacing um, real bees with robot bees, or at least adding robot bees, so that we don't all uh, die from lack of food. Um, but there are smaller robots, like this one, you might think that this is just a funny uh, prototype, but it's not. It's actually something that DARPA is looking at right now to create structures um, that can't be manufactured in any other way. This is a bit creepy, I think. So there can be incredibly fast. And they can climb up into your bed. <laughs> bed. Or walk on flexible surfaces. Yeah? They can work in massive armies. So these are just prototypes. But they're very, very small. You saw how small they were. And here they are working together. Actually, the first micro robot that can move through blood. Blood is very thick, it's very difficult also because there's lots of acids and stuff in blood that has an impact on metal. But the first micro robot that can swim through blood was just released, um, I think also last week. It happened a lot of things last week. Yeah, let's not look at all of this because it's long. But we have to um, we have to be prepared for for robots, large ones like this one printing a house, and small ones like the ones we just saw, and in a lot of other areas. This is not a type of robot, one that you can wear. The uh, EX2, I think it's called, which is an exoskeleton that you can buy and put on, and you get six times stronger than your actual strength. And it's used um, by the US military, of course. And, and uh, it's, really, it's really exciting to see how movable you still are with this one. You can crawl with it, and you can climb with it, and so on. By 2050, researchers in the robot field um, think that there's not a human football team that would be able to win against the robot team. There's already the, the world championships for robot football players today. That's really interesting as well, I think. And there's other researchers saying that by 2050 you can replace every part of the human body except the head. Of course, we would not look like this after seeing what's going on in 3D printing. But it's interesting that you can you will start um, enhancing and, and switching body parts 
to better versions pretty soon. Where's robot technology today? Um, that's interesting as well. This is Boston Dynamics robots. They're the most interesting to watch, I think. Uh, most of them are built for DARPA, or were built for DARPA. And they do scary things, like this one, for example. The, I think it's called a mule. Picks up something very heavy and it throws it at you. So this company was um, acquired, I think, in November or December. Does anyone know who bought Google? Google bought them. So Nana, what are you going to do <laughs> with this evil? <laughs> My bet is that they are uh, using the technology from Boston Dynamics to the automotive industry to make self better self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, because there's a lot of artificial intelligence in this company that they could use. <laughs> we have to see the last one because it's a bit scary. Have you seen this before? Yeah. Yeah. This is commercially used uh, to mount very difficult parts in uh, aircraft wings. It crawls inside the wings and um, mount some parts inside the wings and they save like a couple of days of construction work to do that. Yeah, that was the scary one. Moving on to the last mega trend. Do you think that B2B stands for business to business? That was yesterday. <laughs> it stands for brain to brain. But more um, usual is the brain-to-computer communication. These guys are amazing. Uh, they're from Washington. And one of them is looking at a screen with a game. And he has a, a hood on that's registering his, his brain activity. And there's an airplane coming, and he has a ship. And when he wants to shoot that airplane, he thinks, Shoot it. His brain activity goes over the internet to the other guy who has a stimulator on his head. And without knowing why, he presses the fire button on the keyboard because he has no screen. And they're playing the game like that a couple of hundred meters apart. Did you understand? <laughs> like this. One guy is thinking, shoot the airplane. It goes over the air, uh, over the internet, stimulating this guy's brain. He presses the keyboard, not knowing why. The singing goes back, kills the airplane. So that's a brain, it's a, it's a working brain to brain communication device. So you can read minds. This is another mind reading project that's going on. Um, Researchers took 80 million seconds uh, of YouTube video and showed it to uh, a number of persons and recorded their brain activity <coughs> when they sh showed them um, different types of these seconds and mapped the brain activity to each image. And then when you look at something else, you can read what's going on from the brain activity. These are the images that they that comes out from reading people's mind and mapping it to the 18 million second. This is big data. Um, um, the 18 million seconds of, of image images that they have from YouTube. This is pretty amazing, don't you think? You can read an image out of someone's head. I think it's quite overwhelming. I hope you can read my mind after that. <laughs> you, you have the Google Glasses on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is another experiment. I think it's from Japan, where people um, have
had to really focus on letters and where they did the same thing. They uh, registered brain activity and they could reconstruct <coughs> letters from the data that they... Is, Lance, is this the sort of thing that helped me with prosthetic hands, for example? And you could be able to actually use the hands? Yes, yeah. but that's improving. Yeah. That's the next thing we're going to look at. And we're going to do it that through uh, the Warwicks. This is Kevin Warwick. He is uh, a professor in cybernetics, the only one in the world. Uh, I think mainly because he gave himself that title. <laughs> but he's an amazing guy. He has a ship implanted into his arm, and his wife has one in, in her arm. It's a 100-pin ship that big. It's in, implanted into his nervous system. And one thing that they can do is to send signals to each other. Uh, different, they can sense different emotions in each other over the air. And Kevin, he has done such, a, he has done amazing things with his ship. He took a, uh, a radar and put it on a, on a cap and, and took the signal into his arm and it started to, you know, not make sense at all. But he, he wore it for six weeks. Then he could blindfold himself. His body had learned to interpret the the radar signals into a new sense, something else. And he can walk, he can walk around with his cap on and not walk into things. Just by feeding the data from the, from the radar into the ship in his arm. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And this is what's happening right now. Five people in the US uh, have had ships like this. Uh, implanted into their brains. There it is. Uh, with an external device that's wirelessly transmitting the signal from the brain to a computer. And the computer is, uh, is transcribing it to uh, stimulation, for example, for the arm. So all these people have different types of injuries. The most, the one that's written most about right now, he has a broken spine. So he can't move anything below his chest. But by thinking I want to move my arm and stimulating it through uh, the things that you get out, he can again lift his arm, pick up things. So they've, um, they've hotwired him over the spinal injury that he has. And this is uh, being experimented on five different people in, in use right now. This is really exciting. And it's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.